Hi there, I'm Keaton. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. We would love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way that you can do that is by texting River Connect. That's one word to the number 97,000. You can also head to our website, theriverchurch.cc, to learn more about us in upcoming events. Lastly, if you want to give to the River Church, you can text the amount that you want to give to 84321 or head to our website and click the Give tab. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope you enjoyed today's message. But today, I wanted to do a couple things. There's one more miracle we're going to look at today, and we're going to get to that in a minute. But I wanted to turn, come back and really take a look at the cross. And as, but as I was studying, I actually looked over at my Bible. And this is a Bible that has meant a lot to me. I've told this story, and I'll probably tell this story numerous more times in my ministry. But this is a Bible that, that really, it, it's my preaching Bible. It's what I used to preach, and it's what I used to journal into. And uh, this is a Bible that ultimately I purchased Something I would have never done. It's genuine leather. It's like rebound and like it was done by an actual leather like company and stuff. And, um, but what happened was is there was this just awesome lady that I knew for many, many years. So I've been at Gingerville, or I was at Gingerville for what, 18 years? And then we've been at the river for two and a half years as the river. So I've been out at this location for over 20 years now. And there was this lady by the name of Loretta Gardner that was just an awesome woman that loved God and loved people. I used to take youth ministries over to her home and we'd sing Christmas carols and she'd make sure to have Christmas, car- Christmas cookies out. Some of you here were in those youth ministries. Remember Loretta and went and, and we would sing to her. She just loved Jesus. But she got sick and I'm gonna say probably, I'm gonna say about five, six years ago now, she finally passed and went on to meet Jesus. And we had talked before that, and she's like, I want you to do my funeral, Pastor, and then we want to sing these songs. And she had this plan because she loved the Lord. And then to come to find out after that, there was a directive she had given to give me an, just a, 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 an unreasonable stipend as far as I was concerned to be able to do her funeral. But part of that, I'm like, how could I use that in the ministry and something that she would think would be awesome? And I'm like, I'm going to get a Bible that I normally wouldn't buy, and I'm going to preach from that for as long as I can. And so on the back of this Bible, it's in loving memory for Loretta Gardner. And I bring that up because of the legacy that she had and because of so many of us were touched by her. But the verse that I put on here was purposeful because I always wanted to remind me of something. And I was reminded again this week. And it's 1 Corinthians 2.2. And Paul is speaking and he says, For I decided, and that's in the ESV, but in, in, in other editions, it's, it's for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ. And if he'd stopped there, it kind of would have made sense. But he added three more words. And him crucified. Jesus Christ and him crucified. See, there's a larger context of this verse because Paul was telling the Corinthians, he didn't come to them to sound cool or be an excellent communicator, which he wasn't an excellent communicator, not in person. He wrote better than he spoke. We know that through church history. Not only would, and he was also telling them, don't follow him or lift him up. He had come in weakness. He had come in trembling, knowing that the message he would preach would bring offense and was also the most important thing he could be speaking about because it wasn't about his ability to speak or anything from his wisdom, but it was a demonstration of the Holy Spirit and of power so that faith would not rest in any person or wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And so I was reminded that as I come to you today, and I would ask that you would pray for me this week as I prepare the Easter message, because that's something that, that I just totally want the Holy Spirit to take and be able to preach the gospel with clarity and truth and not the wisdom of men, but the power of God. But I want today and every day to proclaim Jesus and him crucified. That's why we've been looking at the miracles of the cross, because these miracles point to the main thing, that Jesus was crucified. He died for you. He died for me. And the scenes of Matthew chapters 26 and 27 are so central, and it shows us what Jesus went through. Charles Spurgeon said this, here we come to the holy of holies of our Lord's life on earth. This is a mystery like that which Moses saw when the bush burned with fire and was not consumed. 
No man can rightly expound such a passage as this. It is a subject for prayerful, heartbroken meditation more than for human language. And so I ask you, how often do you consider the cross? How often do you think about the cross? If we walk out of this thinking about darkness and a veil and and an earthquake and then what we're talking about today, I'll get to it in a minute. If that's all we walk out of here, then we've missed it. It's Jesus Christ and him crucified. E. Stanley Jones said this, the cross is the key. If I lose this key, I fumble. The universe will not open to me, but with this key in my hand, I know I hold its secret. It's about the cross of Christ. But that got me thinking, why is the cross, why is it the key, why is this death of Jesus of Nazareth the key to understanding everything? Well, the why behind the cross is still significant today, 2,000 years later. We have to realize what is true. We have to realize what is true. And the truth is that without any intervention, without any sacrifice, Every single one of us in this room has to bear the penalty of our sin on ourselves. That's true of our court system. We don't go to court and say, you know, oh, this person did this, but we're going to hold somebody else accountable for it. Unless, of course, recently with parents contributing to that, right? But we don't hold somebody else accountable for what we do on this earth. You get a ticket, wasn't anybody else speeding. You don't get to say, well, everybody else was going fast and you just picked me out. I think you're still gonna get the ticket, man. <laughs> but Jesus came to earth to bear the penalty for our sin. Because everyone, every human being, every person has sinned on the face of the earth. And I get it. Many of us here have probably heard this before, but on the chance that you haven't, I dare not move past this truth. Because when we break God's law, just as when we break the law in any country, we have to bear the penalty of that action. And the penalty of our sin against God, which all of us has done, is death. Forever being separated from God and, and everyone we have ever loved in a very real place called hell. A very real place. God has to judge sin. He would not be just if he didn't. He's righteous in all of his ways. Psalm 145, 17 says, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. Romans 3, 10 to 12 says, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And here's the thing, God is not just angry at sin, he will pour out his wrath on sin. That's what God's word tells us. I know, we're starting out with real encouragement today, right? (laughs) Wrath is a weird word. We don't really talk about wrath much today. But I looked up a little bit of the definition. This is extreme anger, rage, judgment, punishment. And honestly, one of the biggest things that people say against God or whatever, you know, especially when we talk about the gospel, is that he is angry with us. Why is God angry with us? He created us. He set up the conditions for us to fail, and now he's going to punish us for him setting it up? Like it's God's fault that we've sinned. And really, it's, it's an argument to say there is no God. But here's the reality. I believe... And I believe God's word backs us up, and I believe when we look even outside of God's word to extra-biblical sources, it proves that there is a God first and foremost. But what God has done in his ultimate wisdom, and I believe mercy, he chose to love us and allow us to love him. Without choice, there is no love. It's that simple. If we don't have a choice, we cannot love. We simply turn to instinct alone. He chose to, have, to allow us to be in relationship not only to him, but with each other. Without choice, there's only instinct. There's only a programming. And now we turn into nothing more than robots. And this is one of the biggest ways every single one of us in this room and every single one of us on the face of the earth is made in the image of God. Human beings are made in the image of God. That means part of that image is the ability to choose 
And God gave us the ability to choose right from wrong, to choose him or to not choose him. Unfortunately, we have all chosen poorly. And God must pour out his wrath on sin. As I said in week one, it is good for God to hate that which destroys us. It is good for God to hate sin because sin will destroy every single one of us. When we choose a place apart from the Lord, it destroys our lives. And I'm telling you, in over 25, 26 years of ministry, I have seen bad choices destroy people, destroy marriages, destroy kids, destroy parents. It's not like God wants to be the cosmic killjoy. He wants to give us life and to give it abundantly. And it's done at the foot of the cross. But instead, we, ter- we mock, we disregard, and we question God's judgment. In Isaiah 53, 6, God's word says this, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. But that poses a problem. How can God forgive us and remain consistent? Because forgiving us is a threat to God's character. He's loving, but he is also just. How can he be just and forgive people that are guilty? He did it at the cross. And that's why the cross is so central. Because God's wrath fell on Jesus rather than me, rather than you, if you choose him. And see, the cross, so the cross is not just to save us from our sin. Even more so, it is for God's sake. Because it stays true to his character. David Platt said this, Jesus' death was for God's vindication and the declaration of God's glory. It was a declaration of God's glory. So Jesus goes to the cross and he's a substitute sacrifice for our sin. He suffered physically, yes, but even more than that, he suffered spiritually. He is the only one. Guys, see, sometimes we we think so linearly and it's like, my sin equal death, Jesus died for me, so yay, I get to go to heaven. It is so much deeper than that. When Jesus died on the cross... He paid a penalty so that God would see, God the Father would see Jesus instead of you. And when that happens, that means he will never turn his back on you because the Father had to turn his back on Jesus. He's the only one that had that happen to because he became our sin. That's the craziness. And when you really think about it, man, most of us in this room, I'm not going to say most of us, I'm going to say all of us in this room, have thoughts running through our minds that we are so glad nobody else hears. Right? We have thoughts that are like way out there, like where did that come from? Like stuff you'd never really do, and yet sometimes you find yourself doing things that you're also glad that nobody in this room knows that you've done. I want you to get that thought. I want you to get that act, that sin that you struggle with so deeply in the forefront of your mind right now. Jesus became that for you. That attitude, that lust, that selfishness, that pride, that rage. He became that. He took it on himself and nailed it to the cross. That's how deep this cross is. It stands above it all. And that alone is a miracle. And so darkness fell on the earth because God could no longer look on our sin because he became our sin. 
And then right after that, when he died, he, uh, he, he tore the veil from top to bottom saying, you now have access to me. You have full access to me. You can come and find grace and mercy in your time of need. And the last week we learned that the earth mourned over what was happening and it shook at the death of Christ. The death of sadness that was happening that day that the Son of God died. And then today, we get to today's miracle at the cross. If you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, verses 51 to 53 is, is our um, passage today. So how many of you like zombie movies or shows? I like them. I like them. I, I, I've watched The Walking Dead. I got it today say that it's gone a little bit too long. Like the first four or five seasons I thought was good, but now uh, The Walking Dead. Some of you are going, I don't watch zombies. That's okay. My wife doesn't watch zombies either. If I watch a zombie show, I have to do it on my day off on Monday when Jeannie's not around because even the sound uh, it doesn't go well at our house. All right, Jeannie's like, ah, I, I, I have nightmares. Um, but I like, I like World War Z, I Am Legend with Will Smith. That was a freaky movie. I did not know, I got to tell you, I did not know it was a zombie movie. And I took Jeannie to it. On IMAX. <laughs> I didn't live that one down for a little while. Um, but uh, I, I, think, I, think, I think they can be fun. Um, but, and honestly, this morning, as a walk-up song, knowing that this was coming up, I kind of really wanted to play Thriller as a walk-up song, doing the zombie dance, right? The, that that kind of thing. I, I thought it might be fun, but Cam said no. So I... Um, <laughs> Zombies are the next miracle. Kinda. Kinda. Let's read it. Matthew chapter 27, verses 51 to 53. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn, uh, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep, that's dead, were raised. And coming out of the tombs, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. <clears throat> okay, so we got zombies. Let's set, the, let's set the scene and go through the progression. The sky goes dark. Okay. The temple veil tore from top to bottom. There was an earthquake. And as a result of this earthquake, rocks split. Tombs were opened. People were raised from the dead, but the timeline looks like maybe they were hanging out in the tombs for a little bit. I mean, were people like walking by these tombs and they heard people having a conversation? Or was it more the Ugh, going on in there? I wasn't sure what, I don't know what was happening in those tombs, right? We've got something going on here that only Matthew records. And then Jesus was raised from the dead three days later. And then the saints that were in these tombs came out of the tombs, went into, into, into Jerusalem, appearing to many people. Zombies! This is nuts! I mean, can you literally, when you, this is a time we can take a step back and go, can you imagine experiencing everything that happened at the cross? Middle of the day, darkness. Okay, that's kind of freaky. Then the temple veil rips from top to bottom, and that, that goes around. Oh my goodness. What's going on? Then there's an earthquake. And then Jesus raises from the dead. And while you're talking about that, you're walking through the market and Moses is walking down the street going, hey, what's up? <laughs> what? That's, what, the, what the, who's the, you know, that would be freaky. All right? Now, we don't know who was raised, but the idea of saints here are people that were followers of God. However... This isn't the first time this would have been talked about or known. All the way back in Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 11 to 14. Ezekiel, the prophet of God, said this. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost, and we are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. 
and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, I will do it, declares the Lord. See, the imagery shown here was shown to the prophet, of, prophet Ezekiel in his vision from God, and it was about dry bones in a valley that would raise from the dead. The nation of Israel had no hope, but God would bring them back to life. So anybody that saw this probably went back to Ezekiel and went, wait a minute, is there a correlation? Is this the coming back to life, eternal life? Is this what is being spoken of? Are we seeing this? See, they didn't have any reference point of the walking dead. They didn't know they were zombies because they were walking, they were alive. They were looking back at what Ezekiel had said. Not only that, in Zephaniah, or in, sorry, in Zechariah, verses 14, or sorry, chapter 14, 4 to 5, it says this, On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, which is right outside of Jerusalem, that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley. Earthquake. So that one half of the mount shall move northward, the other half southward, and you shall flee to the valley of my mountains. For the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azel. And you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then, my, then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. Now this is foretelling the day of the Lord that we see in Revelation. That's all about when Jesus returns again and ultimate judgment happens. On that day, the Mount of Olives will split. Didn't happen here, but the tombs did. And again, we have to understand this culture. If you were a Jewish person, you knew the scripture. You knew it because it was your history. And it was taking them back. They'd see Moses, whoever they saw walking down the street. They knew they weren't supposed to be alive. And they went back to this. The holy ones had come. They were walking the streets of Jerusalem. Now, some people look at this and they'd say, it sounds like it could be a, a legend or something that's figurative. But in reality, there's nothing in this passage that seems to indicate that Matthew is saying anything but what actually happened. He's giving an account of what happened at the cross. So that raises a lot of questions, and some of these we discussed as location pastors this last week. So, so how many were raised? Are we talking like 10 people? Or are we talking like 10,000 people? Uh, we don't know. Matthew didn't answer that question. Who were they? Was it Moses, Elijah, and others walking the streets? I mean, that had just happened for the disciples seeing Jesus transfigured in the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah shows up, right? And Jesus, he's transfigured into his glory, glorified body, and a couple, some of the disciples get to see that. So that had just happened. Maybe Moses and Elijah just hung out. Then what about this? Was it, was it older saints, or was it like John the Baptist who had just died? How old were they? Here's the question. Did they have heavenly bodies or did they look like they did just before they died? Or did they actually look like zombies? I mean, probably not. I mean, I would think that if they're walking the streets, God would have done something there, right? That, that would be kind of, yeah, weird, even worse. Um, but then who did they talk to? Who'd they go and talk to? They're in, the, they're, in, they're in Jerusalem. Or did they talk? Or were they just walking around? Did they ever actually interact with anybody? I mean, we don't know. How long did they live? Did they go back to heaven with Jesus when he ascended into heaven a little while later? Did they live for a period of time and then they disappeared? We've been watching this show called, uh, um, um, oh my goodness. Yeah, Manifest, thank you. We've been watching Manifest. We just finished it last night. I don't know if you've watched the show. I got to tell you, there's parts of it flat out blasphemy. But the reality is I want to know what the story actually was at the end. And they had like died and then came back at a plane crash and ended up coming. Uh, maybe, do you want to watch a show? Maybe I shouldn't tell you the end. Um, I won't say that. Anyway, this kind of pertains to this in case you want to watch a show. I don't want to, I don't want to give it all up to you. Um, but did they live for a period of time and then, then they died prematurely? Did they live out what the rest of might have been a natural life? Did they die soon after that? Did they come back and then died again? Again, we don't have any answer to those questions. We could discuss this stuff for hours and have fun trying to come up with plausible solutions, I suppose. But what happened wasn't natural. So to come up with natural solutions, I don't think that's probably the best way to go about it. But to be honest, I'm okay with not knowing. I'm okay with not knowing. 
I'm okay with the mystery. God has his reasons for mystery. We will never fully understand God because God is God and we are not. And so there's a mystery here. And Matthew isn't concerned with any of these questions. <coughs> he simply isn't concerned with them at all. He's concerned with only, th- only one thing. It's the cross of Jesus. So what does it mean that people raised from the dead when Jesus died? I loosely borrowed this line from St. Augustine. But it's what happened and it's the title of my message today. Jesus' death killed death. Jesus' death killed death. See, his death didn't just kill sin and its effect on us and satisfy the judgment of the wrath of God. Jesus' death killed death. Revelation 1, 17 to 18 says this, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. He defeated death when he died. Kent Hughes says this, Jesus' death is a resurrecting death. The dead are revived by his dying. As he passes from life to death, they pass from death to life. That's the point of these resurrected people. He goes on and he says, not only is Jesus' death strong enough to split the veil of the Holy of Holies and so cancel sin, it is also strong enough to open tombs and so cancel death. Sin and death are humanity's two greatest problems, and Jesus' death conquers both. You see, the cross is not a cursed tree, but a fruit tree. I love that. Sin and death have died because of what Jesus has done on the cross. How can we not scream, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord on this Palm Sunday? You know, there's a lot of artistry that attempts to capture Jesus on the cross. So much of it has Jesus hanging on the cross with his arms above his head, stretched out as he died. Some artistry even has the cross beams tilted upward. There's a, there's a bronze crucifix in St. Patrick's Cathedral in Armagh in Ireland. And when you really take a look at this and consider how Jesus would have died with his hands up, what does it look like? It kind of looks like a V. It kind of looks like a V. And a lot of artistry, the cross with its cross beams up, looks like a V. The Greek letter for V kind of looks like the Nike swoosh. It's where they got it from. Because it means Nika. And that word is victory. It's victory. See, Jesus' death killed death. It may have looked like a cross, but Jesus was defeating death and sin, and that's there that he won the victory for you and for me. The victory. Commentator Kent Hughes again says this. After all of Jesus' sufferings, physical, which was the scourging, the crown of thorns, the weight of his own body on the cross, the thirst, the loss of blood, the, the, the mental anguish, the mockeries and desertion of his followers, the spiritual, the desertion of the Father himself. Jesus dies victorious. Nika, he conquers. Christ conquers the world, the darkness and the earthquake. Christ conquers sin, the torn veil. He conquers death, the resurrected bodies. That is the cross of Christ to Matthew, and that is to be the cross of Christ to us. Jesus is the victor. No, let me say that again. I think you might have missed that. Jesus is the victor. Guys. It's Palm Sunday. Easter's next week. Sin is defeated. Death is defeated. We got to get awake. It is about this. How dare we take it for granted? How dare we sit and not even celebrate? This is real. And if we don't believe it, our lives won't change. 
See, that's the problem with religion. We sit in our seats and we hear, yay, Jesus died. We got to get out of religion and know Jesus personally so we have a relationship with him. We've got to have a relationship with him. Let it go deep. Because I'm going to continue to proclaim Christ and proclaim him crucified. And we got to realize it and we got to internalize it and we got to go and share it. My friends, every single one of us have a cure to something that is so much more insidious than cancer could ever be. And yet if we had a cure to cancer, we'd tell the world. But we sit in our seats and we don't say a word about who Jesus is. My friends, he is the victor. And it's time to proclaim it. We've got to proclaim it. We've got to proclaim it. Because Jesus' death has conquered death. And when you come to Christ as your Savior, death is no longer something to be feared. I get it. Death is scary. None of us want to die. I don't want to die. With everything going on with Jeannie last week, I was freaking out. My brain was going all over the place. None of us want to die. But death is no longer the end. It's no longer the end. When you give your life to Jesus, you have eternal life. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 to 58. It'll be on the screen behind me. I tell you this, brothers. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Some of you here are facing tough things right now. Some of you have lost loved ones that break your heart. Some of you are facing things that you don't know are going to turn out for your life or the life of a loved one. Health issues. I want to remind you this morning. Jesus' death killed death. And it may not be easy what you're about to go through or what you have gone through. But we don't hope in circumstances because they'll break us. We hope in the one who gave his life at the cross for us, for you and for me. Jesus' death killed death. And that's our hope. That's what we cling to. Because when our bodies take on the imperishable, when the cross and its effect comes to fruition and we are are finally alive in heaven with him, death sting is gone. It's gone because Jesus' death killed death. And so today, as often as I can, I determine there's nothing among you And among us, then Jesus and him crucified. I proclaim again today that Jesus alone is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except by him. And if you call on the name of the Lord today, if you call on the name of the Lord, and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved today. And if you share that with someone and they accept Christ, they'll be saved right where they sit, right where they are. This is a message too important to keep to ourselves. Some of us in this room have very close loved ones who 
do not know Jesus. My friend, live your life for Christ. I get it that some of us in the room and we're like, how do we actually talk to the people that we love the most? Because I'm a family member. This is what you do. You live for Christ. Stop playing a game. Live for Christ completely. Give your life to him. In those moments that are hard, you keep pushing into Christ. Because the most important decision any one of us will ever make is the decision about Jesus Christ. Every person on the face of the earth needs a Savior, and his name is Jesus. Take the opportunities to live your life for Christ and to let your life proclaim Christ and use words to talk about Christ. Because Jesus' death killed death. Thanks be to God, who has given us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray we leave with hope today. Because again, it doesn't matter how far you've gone, it doesn't matter what you've done. When you come to the cross of Christ, the cross stands above all. I just want to encourage you. If you're hanging on to something that's difficult, come to him. If you don't know Jesus as your savior, ask the questions that you have. I'd be honored to have coffee with you. I'd be honored to talk with you. There's people at guest services that would love to speak with you.